What is up, everybody? Welcome to my interview with Hall of Famer and one of the greatest pitchers of all time, Greg Maddox. We sat down for about an hour, talked about pitch grips, pitching mechanics, what it's like to work with Jacob deGrom, some maybe not safe for work stories, a whole bunch of stuff. You're not going to want to miss it. But before we get to that interview, please make sure to hit that subscribe button because I've got a lot of other interviews coming up for you and a whole bunch of other great pitching content. So hit subscribe. And without further ado, here's my interview with the legend, Greg Maddox. What is up, Greg? I'm much just hanging out, uh, enjoying the summer down in Dana Point and uh, heading back to Vegas here shortly. And, and you're just amazed that you're able to talk to the pitching ninja. Well, yeah, I mean, my son's told me a lot about you and says, you know, more about pitching than anybody. So, uh, always happy to learn something. <laughs> well, I just got off a call with, with Nick Swisher and he said in 2004, he was like trying to make a name for himself. He was hitting against you first at bat. He was down. He was, he was up 2 zero. you threw him three straight sinkers. He's trying to swing out of his shoes and missed next time up. Same thing, down 2-0. He was expecting a sinker, got swinging out of his shoes. Three quarters of the way there, he swung, hit a ball right off his thumb and broke his thumb. And he had a play. Yeah, so he was like, that motherfucker, Greg Maddox. <laughs> so I broke his thumb or he broke his thumb? I, I bet. Mean- <laughs> <laughs> I wish I could remember the at-bat, to be honest with you, because it sounds like a good one. I think, uh, uh, you know, as a pitcher, if you could, you know, break something at, on a hitter, you'll probably, you're, you're probably going to remember it. You know, I remember hitting a guy uh, in the ankle once and breaking his foot, so I think uh, I would remember. I didn't hit him, right? He swung and did something, I assume. He, he swung. He said it hit right off the handle. He didn't know his thumb was broken. He got an huh. image the next, like a couple days later. He's like, I think my thumb's messed up. And they're like, um, yeah, your thumb's messed up. Oh, crap. Poor guy. Uh, <laughs> my, was it a cutter? Was it off the end or did it, was it off the hands? I don't remember. He said it was a cutter. He thought it was a sinker okay. coming in and it was right. a cutter. Yeah. Okay. Well, good. That's why the cutter was invented, to try to get him off your sinker. I mean, that's the whole point of it. Well, I, I've got to tell him because he didn't think you'd remember it because he didn't even show any pain. Like he ran the first base. He's like going off and he's like, man, this hurts. Yeah. Uh, Al Leiter got me one year with the cutter and my thumb hurt for about two months, I remember. So, uh, uh, yeah, it's not fun. That's for sure. <laughs> I'll tell him he remembered it more than you did, which is perfect because Nick, it'll just take Nick down a little bit of a notch. I mean, he, he can use it. Well, if he played it off, I mean, you know, if he played it off, he just probably, I probably just thought he got jammed a little bit personally. So, you know, I mean, I hit enough and been jammed enough to know what it feels like. It's not fun. What was the hardest pitcher? Who was the hardest pitcher for you to hit off of? Uh, Kevin Brown was pretty nasty, you know, uh, David Cohn, he would throw his sliders that kind of started right at your, you know, right at your pecker and you'd flinch and couldn't pull the trigger on it. Uh, Dwight Gooden was tough hitting. I mean, there, there, there was, there was a lot of guys, but Kevin Brown, I think he was, uh, I couldn't even bun off him. I mean, I didn't see his sinker at all. I didn't, I didn't know where the ball was the last 20 feet when I hit off him. I got to tell him that because his son played with my son at Georgia Tech. So, uh, oh, okay. Yeah, so I've I've texted with him before. I've talked to him before, and we'll I'll make sure he knows that. So you were just working. You were out working with Texas in in spring, right? Yeah, I did like three weeks of spring training. I went down there to uh, help get my brother acclimat- acclimated and uh, uh, just to help him out a little bit. You know, they have they had like I think forty pitchers in camp, so they kind of needed an extra coach or two, and uh, just went down for a short period of time and. Really enjoyed the experience. It was uh, good getting a little taste of pro ball again. What What was your impression? Like, I saw pictures of you working with with the legend Jacob Degrom. What was your impression of, yeah. of him? I mean, just incredible. I mean, just the the players now are so much more talented than than we were. I mean, uh, you know, the velocity is 
just gone off the charts and uh, it's pretty impressive to watch and, and and then to actually see somebody that has command and actually knows where it's going uh was pretty impressive you know there's there's kind of there's a few ways to get hitters out and, and you know one is to outstuff them and I, I think that's what we see a lot of now we see a lot of guys just trying to outstuff the hitter like you know you can't hit it no matter where i throw it and then there's you know, selection and command. And, and and I think DeGrom was able to do both. You know, he had pitch selection, he had command, and he was also able to outstuff the hitters. So I think, uh, uh, you know, when you can combine the two, you know, you're looking at, you know, the elite pitchers in the game. Yeah, I mean, so everybody uses you as an example. And, and this, well, you don't have to throw hard. Look at Greg Maddox. Greg Maddox was, you know, one of the greatest pitchers of all time. Some would say the greatest pitcher of all time. And then you have guys like DeGrom who do who do both. Is there a spectrum of like, you know, this guy's got insane command, can make the ball move um, versus Velo? Like, where do you trade those things off and and how do you view them in importance? Um, and would you ever wish to to throw harder? Well, I mean, obviously, I mean, I threw it as hard as I could most of the time. You know, it just didn't look like it. Uh, you know, I think you look at the results, you look at who's winning, you look at innings pitch, you look at ERA, uh, look at wins, you know, uh, uh, look at, you just look at the success the pitcher's having, you know, on, on, on the field. And, and uh, I think that's where you look, you look for results. You don't look for to light up the radar gun or, or see what the spin rate is. You look to see who's getting the most hitters out and who's staying in the game the longest. Would it have helped you at all? Like today, there's so much information, right? Like, like you have huh? information on everything, spin rate, uh, the statistics on how hitters do against certain pitches, heat maps, like really detailed heat maps. I know you yeah. guys, everybody had scouting reports back in the day too. Yeah. W yeah. What would you have done with that information? I hopefully I would have used it to my advantage. You know, I think we did our own scouting. You know, I think most of it was sitting in front of the video room and, and watching guys hit and, and talking to your teammates and talking to hitters as well. Like, you know, hey, why'd you swing at that pitch? Or how'd you lay off of that one? Or, or you know, those type things. Uh, you know, we had the inside edge that came out late in my career. And, uh, you know, you can find that, I think it was Dante Bichette was a guy that he hit something like 040 on change-ups, unless he had one or two strikes on him. Then he hit like 480 on changeup. So, you know, you can pull out little tidbits and know that, you know, you can throw this guy a changeup before you get strike one, but after you get strike one, you don't want to throw it anymore. So uh, uh, you can use it, you know, you can use it to your advantage to help with your pitch selection. You know, there's usually, there's usually only one pitch you don't want to throw, you know, in each count. And, you know, if you're a guy that has, you know, four or five pitches, you know, if you have five pitches and there's one pitch you shouldn't throw, you know the other four, right? So uh, that's kind of how I look at pitch selection. And, and and you know, when you go to pick one of those four pitches that you have, you just throw the one you're most comfortable throwing. Did you, did you make adjustments based on what a hitter was doing against you in that at bat, or did you come up with a plan beforehand? Did you notice little things about what a hitter would do in reading swings? No, I went pitch to pitch. Uh, I went pitch to pitch and tried to read each swing or each take or, or, and, you know, you have to also know where the pitch was, you know, just because you threw a guy a fastball and he had a good swing at it doesn't mean, you know, you can't throw him another fastball. You know, if the fastball was up and down the middle, you know, you didn't get it down in a way where you wanted it. You can come back with that pitch. Uh, but yeah, I read the swings pitch to pitch. Uh, you know, it's hard to have a game plan if, I'm going to throw this guy a one-one changeup, and you know, all of a sudden the count's two zero. Then what? So, uh, you know, I just went one pitch at a time, and if I saw something that the hitter did, if I saw if he was looking in or away or hard or soft, then I would try to adjust on the next pitch. So I talked to Leo too, and Leo tells these stories about how you know you would think four pitches in advance, and you would say I'm going to do this, this, and this. The hitter's going to do this, this, and this, and then I'm going to get him to pop up. You know the story about about that. Um, how much of that's true? How much of that isn't true? Well, there are certain there are certain pitches that you think a hitter's got a really good chance to pop up, you know. And uh, if you got a base open and you're not worried about walking them, 
uh, that's when you take an opportunity to keep throwing that, you know, that fastball kind of up and in, hoping he'll pop it up. And, you know, you see on video, you see enough times on video that, that you think, you know what, this is going to work again. You know, hitters are a creature that, Hitters are a creature of habit, you know, it's something I believe in. And uh, I think hitters remember success. So they're not going to remember, you know, getting the ball up and in and that, that they pop up as opposed to the home run that they hit off you, you know, last month. So you would tend to throw something that maybe looked like something they hit a home run off of um, and then they kind of disguise it and get them to, to pop up or swing and miss or whatever. Well, not, not necessarily that. I think if, if you throw a, a semi-decent pitch and the hitter hits a home run off you, I think you really got to look at your pitch selection. You know, your pitch selection is not very good against that hitter. And knowing the hitter is more likely to remember that pitch he hit out of you, then you know that's one pitch you're probably not going to throw him for the rest of his career. So uh, <laughs> that's kind of how I looked at it. And, you know, I didn't mind making mistakes. I just had a hard time making the same mistake twice. Yeah, I heard that quote. You were talking to, uh, I forgot, it was a minor league team, I think it was, and I, it stuck with me. Like, I think a lot of people are so scared to make mistakes, and you try to avoid mistakes, but it's almost the only way to learn is to make a mistake, but don't make that same mistake again. Well, exactly. You know, I think, uh, you know, just things happen. You know, things happen for a reason. You know, hitter, hitters see the ball different off you than most pitchers, or or they might see it the same, but I think... You know, that's kind of the whole key about pitch selection is understanding what the hitter is looking for and trying to do off you. And then you could try to adjust accordingly. So you grew up in Vegas, uh, probably around, you know, gambling, betting, cards, all that. How much is yeah. pitching like playing cards? Well, I mean, you always like to have the odds in your favor. I mean, uh, and, you know, usually they are before the game even starts, because let's face it, if you go one out of three, you're in the Hall of Fame. So, I mean. You know, the odds are stacked against the hitter to begin with. So, you know, that that's just the importance of throwing strikes and getting ahead of hitters and, and having your pitching fundamentals. You know, I think uh, something that's always stuck with me is what's a leak hit on the first pitch, on first pitch strikes. You know, and everybody says, oh, they hit 300, they hit 290, they hit 320, when they actually hit 068. You know, if you look at all the first pitch strikes thrown in baseball the last year or two, league average is like 068 on first pitch strikes so uh you know the hitters don't only want to count the balls put in play but i think the pitchers want to count all the first pitch strikes so you know you get those lopsided numbers and and you know i'm a firm believer that if the league's hitting 068 on first pitch strikes why am i afraid to get ahead of a hitter you know when the count's 00 the the other thing you said that that i think people it just made them go whoa is the O2 waste pitch like the idea of wasting a pitch when you have a hitter, you know, the back they're back against the wall? Um, go into your thought process on that. It's very simple. What, what's the hardest count to hit in? I mean, it's it's O2, right? You can ask any hitter, <laughs> O2 is the hardest count to hit in, so make them hit. You know, that's my my you know, my goal as a pitcher is to make you hit 0-2. If that's the lowest batting average in the game, why am I going to waste a pitch and go to 1-2? You know, I mean, yeah. uh, I'm going to try to make you hit 0-2. And if that's the hardest count to hit in, it's also the easiest count to throw a strike in. That got a lot of high school coaches thinking because every high school coach is, is like, you can't, you know, if you get a, if you give up a hit on 0-2, someone's going to go running. And oh, yeah. 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 I heard that. Yeah, I heard that when I got to Atlanta. Smoltzy gave up an 0-2 hit, and Leo went ape shit on the bench. <laughs> and I'm over there looking at Leo going, hey, don't get mad at me when I give up my 0-2 hits. And, you know, I got the typical old school answer. Ah, oh, you can't never give up a hit 0-2. You should never, you know, do that 0-2. And, and you know, I just told Leo, look, I, I mean, I'm going to leave the league in 0-2 hits, but I'm also going to leave the league in 0-2 out. So, I mean, you know, there's there's going to be a little give and take with it. And, uh, you know, I really believe the less pitches the hitter sees during an at-bat, the better chance you have to get them out. And that, you know, starts to stack up, you know, the second, third, and fourth fourth at-bats against you as well. So if you can limit the amount of pitches the hitter sees, you know, his his first couple of bats during the game, you're, you're going to have that slight advantage when it comes, you know, for the seventh, eighth, and ninth. 
The, the other thing, so back in the day, there was this philosophy of you start off with your fastball, establish your fastball, pitch off that. Today, it's kind of flipped, right? Like you have a lot of guys starting out with all their stuff. Um, yeah. What do you think about that? I think, I think it takes a hitter two or three or four pitches before they're really on your fastball. You know, I think uh, uh, it's hard to go up there your first at bat and be on the fastball. So I think, you know, if you can get a hitter out with your fastball only the first time through the lineup, I think that's a huge advantage for you as the game goes on. But, you know, at the same time, you don't just want to be pumping heaters in there and, and hoping to fly out somewhere or hit a line drive at somebody. So, you know, it's kind of – that's where you have to use, you know, your feel for the game. It is your command – where, where it needs to be yet and 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 you know like i said it, it's it's really one pitch at a time and never to look too far ahead so th that one pitch at a time thing is a dorfman thing right um yeah, or it is. so what, what, what did you learn from from dorfman because i mean i've obviously read his book i think he's fantastic and yeah. uh, so how did he help you in your career uh you learn to trust yourself i think trust what you see Trust what you remember. Uh, own up to your bad decisions. Don't lie to yourself. Uh, be honest with yourself. Uh, those are the big things, you know. Uh, treat people the way you want to be treated. Stuff like that. Uh, just, just a lot of basic, fundamental, common sense stuff that somehow, in the heat of the moment, we tend to forget. You know, when the game speeds up and and you have that out-of-body experience, you know, you kind of just, he clarifies the things you see during the course of the game and the emotions you might feel before the game. How much of the game do you think is, is mental? Uh, there's a lot. A lot of it's mental. You know, I think physically you have to be gifted enough to play the game, but then, you know, mentally you have to be strong enough to get the most out of your ability and, you know, I think that takes practice. It takes repetition. Uh, you have to be aware of it when you make a, a, a mental mistake so it doesn't happen again. And, you know, it's hard to really put a number on it. But, you know, if if everybody had the exact same amount of ability, it would be 100% mental after that. But there are differences in, in, in skills with the players and all that. So, you know, but it's up there. It's pretty high. Who is who's the most talented physically among the uh the brave starters back in the day? Uh Andrew Jones, Chipper for call. You know, I think those guys, you know, were just a little Chipper was just a better hitter, better eyesight, better thinker, had a great memory, could remember what pitchers did to him and back in spring training during the middle of the season. Uh Andrew Jones was just incredibly sneaky, fast, and gifted, and strong. And, you know, for call, had the great arm, the great range, the great speed. You know, those three guys come to mind. Brian Jordan was that way, too. Brian Jordan could cover all kinds of ground in the outfield and hit with power. So, uh, you know, we had a lot of great players over there. Over, You know, I mean, I was there for over a decade. We had a ton of great players. And, and what about the, the pitchers? Was it, I mean... I don't want you to give Smoltzy any shout outs because his head will get bigger, right? Well, yeah, or Balder, one or the other. <laughs> uh, Smoltzy was probably the most talented pitcher we had as far as like in today's game with the velocity and the spin rates and, and you know, the command and all that. I mean, he had a, you know, he threw mid 90s, had a just a nasty slider, could throw a fork ball, could throw a knuckle ball. There wasn't a pitch in it he couldn't throw. Uh, you know, probably easily Smoltzy. You know, I thought Kevin Millwood had great stuff. He was tough to see, hard to see off of. Uh, Glavin, Glavin had late funk that you just couldn't see it. I think, uh, you know, back in Atlanta, you know, the first 10 days of spring training when it was just pitchers only, we would hit off each other. So, you know, we would throw our live BP to the other pitchers and vice versa. We'd grab a bat and then you'd get to go hit off these guys. And, and, uh, you know, the one thing about Glav was you saw the ball pretty good, but it did something the last 10 feet, and that's what you didn't see. 
and he seemed to always catch it off the end a little bit. And uh, he had the late funk. So, you know, everybody had their own little thing that they did pretty good. Interesting. Because uh, Wagner said, uh, Billy Wagner said, if John Smoltz was a closer his entire career, he would have been the greatest closer of all time. And he had no doubt about it. Like he was like, he was amazing. Yeah, he probably would have been. Because, you know, again, he was the most gifted. It wouldn't surprise me one bit. Uh, uh, Eckersley, as great a closer as he was, I mean, he started the first half of his career, too. So, I mean, uh, uh, you know, I think Randy Johnson had a chance to be one of the greatest closers ever, too. And Roger Clemens, you know, had those guys <laughs> closers. I mean, uh, uh, why wouldn't some of the best pitchers also be some of the best closers? Yeah, absolutely. Where do you stand? So bringing up Clemens, um, where do you stand on the Hall of Fame candidacy of Clemens and Bonds? Well, you know, obviously, you know, with the steroids, if they took them, you know, they shouldn't be in the Hall of Fame. If they didn't take them, they 100% should be in the Hall of Fame. You know, I think uh, uh, everybody assumes that they took them. Uh, you know, I thought they were Hall of Famers if they did take them before they took them. If they never took them, then they're getting screwed big time. They should be in the Hall of Fame. Uh, you know, you can't have – there's too many players that, that played the game clean that are in the Hall of Fame, and it would kind of taint what they accomplished, you know. So I, I kind of understand how you can't have players that took steroids in the Hall of Fame. You know, and that's what kind of example does that set for the youth today? You know, it's, it's, you know, it just, it says it's okay to cheat and, you know, it's not, you know, you always hear that if you're not cheating, you're not trying, you know, that's, that's, you know, that's not what good players do. Good players go out there and find a way to win the right way. You had one of the all time great quotes about Barry Bonds, about him being the easiest guy to pitch to. Yep. hundred percent. He was, cause if it mattered, you just walked him. I mean, <laughs> It's not hard to throw four pitches, you know, in the in the in the right-handed batter's box. Yeah, Leo said the same. He's like, we, there was a point where Bonds, you just couldn't do anything against him. Yeah, he's locked in. I mean, he, uh, I mean, offensively, one of the most incredible years ever. And, uh, you know, uh, you learn to beat lineups and not hitters. You know, I think with with Barry Bonds was a good example of that. I think Mark McGuire's an example of that. Tony Gwynn was an example of that. Uh, Gary Sheffield, Mike Piazza, you know, there's just certain guys, you know, you gotta get 27 outs. So you gotta pick your fights accordingly. You know, I don't have to get, I have to get 27 outs. I don't have to get Barry Bonds out four times. I just gotta keep him in the park. So I think that was, uh, the main objective, say, facing somebody like him was, if I don't give a home run, I win. Is, is it fair to say that Tony Gwynn was kind of the Greg Maddox of hitting? Uh, well, it's not fair to Tony. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, he was just a good pure hitter. I mean, he, uh, he was hard to get off balance, very hard to get off balance. And uh, incredible eyesight, you know, best back control of you know probably anybody that 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 we played against and uh but you know if you got the other eight guys out and kept him in the park you know you're probably going to get a win against the Padres today <laughs> Did, one of the things uh I I heard Jake Peavy say that you told him the biggest lesson he learned was before you get on the rubber know what pitch you're going to throw and have absolute conviction in it do you remember that conversation and how big a deal is that uh, it's huge, you know, especially if you're calling your own game. I think that's one of the problems with, you know, why you don't see pitchers having a little more success today with the amount of talent they have is because, you know, they got the earpiece in and the catcher's telling them what to throw. And, you know, kids nowadays, the kids we're seeing playing in the big leagues today didn't call their own games in high school or college. And I think they're used to having somebody else call their games for them. So the conviction – the conditions not the same when you do it yourself. You know, if I if if you know what the hitter's gonna hit, and you know he can't hit, then it's real easy to be con. It's real easy to have conviction, and uh, you know that's kind of that was kind of the whole thing what you're always trying to figure out with your pitch selection. And I think, you know, I think the majority of the pitchers today are just throwing what the catcher puts down. 
So if you had a pitch com now, now they actually let pitchers call pitch and some guys are doing yeah. that. Like you see like yeah. Granky doing it. You would do that, right? hundred percent. hundred percent. And then you, so you did your all, how hard was it for a catcher to get on the same page as you? Uh, not hard. It wasn't hard at all. I think, uh, you know, it's not hard. Plus you can always cross them up. You know, if they're not, I didn't really throw it, you know, towards the end, I didn't really throw hard enough to uh, hurt anybody and I could cross up catchers and they had no problems catching it and throwing it back. So, uh, you know, I think my last two years, I only gave location. There was no pitch for a sign. It was just inside or outside. I mean, yeah. I had three pitches, so just catch it and throw it back. And they were all okay with that. Interesting. I did not know that. Yeah. Yeah. Now, now there was a point, I, and I hesitate to ask this, but I did see at one point, and I've tweeted it at one point too, there was um, something with, I think it was Javi, where you got into it. I think he might have called a pitch you didn't like, and you were just like, why would you, why would you call that? Um, and you had him think, did you do some of those teaching moments for catchers? Uh, no, I, I always, I, I looked at it this way. If, if I'm Javi Lopez, okay. Uh, I'm catching Glavin, Smoltz, Avery, six guys out of the bullpen. I'm trying to hit. I've got all this stuff that I have to do. And as a starting pitcher, I'm pitching every fifth day. So what am I doing the other four days? Okay. I'll take care of the pitch selection. And then, you know, my catchers, they only had to do two things. They had to set up right and try to hit a home run. That was it. You know, I mean, that's all I wanted them to do was set up right, good target and, and I'll handle the game calling. Do you, do you remember a specific best pitch you ever threw? Uh, there's, there's one that stands out. You know, I had a game, I think it was my second year. I was, uh, it was the 11th inning, bases loaded, 3-0 count. Luis Alce was hit, and I threw strike one, strike two. And I knew I should have threw him a change up when the count got to 3-2. But because the bases were loaded, I was afraid to walk him. And uh, I threw the fastball, gave up a base hit, uh, Two runs scored. I gave up another hit. I ended up losing the game three to nothing. And I said, if I ever get in that situation again, I'm going to throw a change up. And about four or five years later in San Francisco, same situation. I was winning one to nothing in the eighth inning. Had Dave Martinez 3-2 through the change up. Got the swing and a miss. And, you know, it was like, you know, you learn from your mistakes. You know, you learn from your mental mistakes we were talking about earlier. And that was one I made. And I was. I had to wait like four or five years to try to correct it, and you know it always it always helps when it works too. Absolutely, there was one pitch I remember, and this was in the Eric Gregg game, um, where you threw a two seamer to uh, I think it was Moises Alou, back door yeah. maybe it was. Do yeah, you I remember that at all. Yeah, that pitch was absolutely nasty, and I, I will say, uh, the hitter before. I don't know. He must have hit a ground ball, but that ball was scuffed so bad. It had like a little bit of a hole on the side of it. And, you know, back then, you know, if you got a ground ball to short, you got the ball back and you got to use that ball to the next hitter. Now, as soon as the ball touches the ground, they give you a new one. But, uh, yeah, that was just a case where the ball had a scuff on it. And, uh, you know, that's why you have to learn how to use a scuff when you get one. So explain this to people, because I think that's a great point. Um, the ball, how, how do you make a ball move with a scuff? Uh, well, as a rule, it's just opposite the side of the scuff. Yep. So if, if you want to sink it, obviously you want, I'm right-handed. So I want the ball, you know, facing the left-handed batter's box. And then you just go ahead and launch it and throw it the way you'd normally throw it. And you just get a little more sink on it. But, uh, yeah, I remember that pitch cause, uh, I couldn't wait to use the to keep using the ball and i think the next hitter came up and fouled off the first one out of play and it was like oh, okay well okay all things are fair again it, it is one of those pitches that I, I i was going back through games and i saw it and i was like it just broke it like broke the internet when they saw it they're like what is greg maddox doing how did this ball yeah. do that yeah that's why it's illegal to scuff baseballs 
because if you if you could scuff balls like that, you'd be able to throw that pitch every time. Yeah, that would be a little unfair. Yeah. Uh, I know that you were working with Bryce Elder on a cutter. Do you like the way he throws generally? Is he one of those guys that you would watch and say, hey, this guy's got a little bit of Greg Maddox in him? Yeah, same type of fastball. Uh, I don't think he throws a cutter, to be honest with you. I think he could use a cutter. Obviously. Yeah, that's what I, Yep. But, uh, you know, would really complement his fastball. You know, that's it goes back to what we talked about earlier with uh, Nick Swisher. You know, he, he was swinging at a sinker and got a cutter. I mean, it, it works. And uh, uh, it's hard for the hitters to pick that up. And uh, he does have the same type fastball. I saw him pitch once or twice this year. And uh, obviously, it was a lot faster than mine. But it had the same, it had the same type depth on it, I think, as mine did. Do you remember how fast the fastest pitch you've ever thrown was? Uh, I was 93, 94 back when I was first coming up. You know, everyone says I didn't throw hard. You know, when I signed, I threw hard. I threw I threw as hard as anybody on my team. And, uh, you know, but I did also learn growing up that movement was more important than location. And I also learned that movement was more important than velocity and changing speeds was more important than velocity. Location was more important than velocity. You know, I learned I learned those things back in high school. And, uh, very fortunate. Uh, I had a pitching coach that was kind of an older guy, Ralph Meter, that had been around a while. He had he had taught Mike Morgan, my brother, uh, a couple other guys from Vegas, and uh, you know he always preached movement over velocity. He, you know, he said you you'll throw hard enough to get drafted, but in order to have success, you're going to have to learn how to make the ball sink and run. And uh, you know, back then he changed my arm angle a little bit. I wasn't so over the top and uh, started getting more movement on the ball. And uh, very fortunate to have him in my past. Do you, do you think that you can teach somebody command? It, to me, command seems like one of the harder things to teach. Yeah, it's kind of like running fast. You know, you, you it, it's you can't really teach somebody how to run fast, but you can teach somebody how to run a little bit faster. You know, I think uh, commands like a pickoff move. Some pitchers have really good pickoff moves, and 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 some don't. Uh, can you learn a better move? Yes. Command kind of the same way. I think you can do things to improve command, but to actually sit there and teach it. That's 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 a hard thing to do. Is it speaking of of pickoff moves and stuff? You were obviously one of the greatest fielding pitchers of all time. I mean, all those gold gloves and stuff. Number one, how much pride do you take in that? Number two, why why were you that good at fielding? Well, I uh, you know, like most guys, I played shortstop in high school, shortstop in center field. So I was a fielder. Uh, it's important to win. You know, I, I always felt like if if I could if I could have 90 total chances and, and make all 90 plays, that's 30 scoreless innings right there. So what's that do to your ERA, your innings pitched, your one loss record over the course of the season? So, you know, I, I took pride in it. I, I, I believe that every time the pitcher touches the ball, it should be an out, you know, and uh, I think the little things add up and you know, fielding your position correctly will add up and it, it's going to help you and your team win more games. One of the other things that showed your incredible athleticism was that slide at home plate that always comes up like once a year you see it where, you, you know, the little head fake D. What's up with that? I don't know. I don't know. One of those things. I can't believe the coach sent me. I was out by 30 feet. <laughs> you know, it was one of those and, uh, uh, I knew I missed home plate. I was just going to act like I touched it in case, you know, they didn't see it. And then, you know, when the catcher came at me, I just, I don't know. I just kind of reacted. And, uh, you know, I think if you do that nowadays, you might be called for being out of the baseline, but back there, there was no baseline established behind home plate. I think now if you overrun home plate, you reestablish a baseline. So I think, uh, uh, they might've changed that rule over the years. You also had that famous uh, the 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 fake throw to get it. Was it Millage at home plate? I think it was. Who was that? Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, I didn't feel like I had to play it first, so you know, I felt like <laughs> you could get a pretty aggressive base runner back there. I think, uh, you know, why not try to make something happen? And 
you know, he bit, he bit and it worked. And, uh, you know, you see it all the time. It's very rarely does it work. You just need the right base runner out there for it to happen. So, so I, I was interviewing two of your friends. I think they're your friends. Um, Glendon Rush and, and Rich Hill. Oh, yeah. Yeah, they, absolutely. Yeah, and they told some stories that, like, you seem like a fine, upstanding individual, but they were telling stories about, like, how you would chart the number of days you went to the weight room by putting a booger on the wall and stuff like that. You wouldn't do that, would you? Uh, people like to make stuff up as time goes by. You know, uh, it seemed like... Uh, you know, if, if somebody peed on somebody in the shower, I got blamed on it freaking two years later. Like, all of a sudden, that person didn't do it. I must have done it. So uh, I took the blame for a lot of stuff and still do. I mean, I still hear stories, and, and I don't remember that story that way. But, uh, no, I didn't know a lot of boogers on the on the weight chart. <laughs> I'm, the new I'm, ones. I'm, Who said that, Rushy or Dick Hill? I, I believe that was Rush that said that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he made that up. He made that up. I'm going to make sure that he knows that, that that story is not true. And I never want to hear that again out of him. Maybe I'll shoot him a text and say, what's up with the bugger story? Did that really happen? <laughs> I don't remember doing that. I mean, not saying I didn't do it, but I certainly don't remember doing it. Yeah. yeah and then, and then Dick Mountain told the story about charting farts or something like that at a dugout. That you, instead well, that's, of charting... that's what we do. I mean, that's, that's a way to have fun with the game and kill time. And, you know, you're, you're counting pitches and guys are going off around you left and right. So you might as well start counting those as well. So we did do that. And uh, I will say that Glendon Rush was probably one of the best at winning that game that day. And uh, <laughs> he is really to the state, the only pitcher to start a game and win the fart game on the same day. I think he went like five or six innings that day and came back last three and rallied. And, and I don't know who he passed to win the game, but he did. He, I think he got a star put on his locker that day. He's an impressive dude. I mean, that's that's some that's some talent. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, you know, some guys are very talented at, at weird things, and you know, Rushy's Rushy's <laughs> at the top of the list. Um, going back in the day, I, I did a little short on you uh, hitting Jose Canseco, which is a psycho move, by the way. Like, who the hell does that? Um, that like I'm usually okay with someone saying it slipped. That didn't slip, did it? No way. That's well. Here's the thing: Walt Weiss got hit twice that game, and you know it's it's that's the tired American League. It's like the pitcher doesn't have to hit, so it's like you can't wait to get the pitcher because he's never going to come up there and hit. And uh, uh, Walt was pretty pissed, and and. Uh, I go, you want me to do anything? And he said, yeah. So it's like, you know, it was just sticking up for your teammate. It was nothing about Jose Canseco. He was just, he was just up at the, you know, the, 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 the moment of the game dictated when somebody was going to get hit. And uh, it, it just happened to be him. But that was, that was where, you know, you need, you really need the respect of your teammates playing behind you and, and Walt played as hard as anybody for us at shortstop and and uh he wanted payback so you're happy to oblige yeah because I, I saw you do an angry hand lick afterwards too like Jose looked at you he's a big dude like I wouldn't want to f with him no I no last thing I want to do is have him freaking come charging after me but you know Jose's pro he he understands the game and and you know it's one of those situations where if he needs to go charge somebody he needs to charge the pitcher that he'll walk twice now he he later on I think was on a plane with you and said I'm on a plane with Greg Maddox and and he won't even look at me or something like that okay <laughs> you know how you know some you know somebody but you don't recognize them yeah it was it was one of those like no nah, I don't think that's him who is I th you know, I thought he was a football player. Like, where do I know this guy from? And uh, had I known it was him, I would have loved to have talked to him on the plane. Because I think he sat like, you know, he was an aisle or two away from me. It would have been nice to go over and talk to him. Even talk to him about that game, you know, and just kind of hear his take on it. And, you know, maybe he would want to hear what I had to say about it. Yeah, I mean, I think he handled it well. I think both of y'all handled it well. Like, there was, yeah. what else are you going to do? I mean, that's, that's baseball. You know, that's baseball. You know, if uh, if we were if we were in Atlanta 
as soon as that pitcher came up, he would have freaking wore one. And then it would have been done. You know, it would have been over with. And uh, Jose wouldn't have had to get hit. Do you think you lose something from the game without pitchers hitting in that, like knowing how filthy it is or how hard it is to hit or how sequencing works? Do you think hitting helps you know that? 100 percent. 100 percent. Uh, you learn a lot about pitching when you go up there and try to hit off guys. I think, uh, you know, the biggest thing is you learn how your eyes work, you know, and, and how you recognize pitches or don't recognize pitches. And uh, I know there were very few curveballs that I that I could recognize, and I know why I recognized them. And, uh, you know, some of them I just couldn't see them at all and just would swing and miss, you know, over and over again. So, uh uh, yeah, you do learn a lot. How well do hitters recognize spin, you think? Uh, if they're actually swinging and trying to hit, I don't think they see it that good. You know, I think they see angles. They see deliveries. Uh, I think they see tendencies. You know, I remember uh, playing cards with Chipper one day at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, and he said, if this guy throws me a 1-0 changeup, I'm going to take him deep to left center. And sure enough, the second at bat, the count was 1-0. He threw him a changeup, and he took him deep to left center. I don't necessarily think he saw spin on a changeup. I thought he was just sitting changeup, and, you know, he's good enough to hit it out to the opposite field. So, uh, you know, I know if I'd looked for a slider and got a slider, I don't know if I saw the spin, but I do know if they threw me a fastball, I would have been way late trying to hit it. Gotcha. And did you ever try, you did try to tunnel it. Like you're one of the original tunneling guys. Like you would make your pitches kind of look the same on the way to home plate and let the movement do the work type of thing. Yeah, exactly. You know, I imagine a brick about 10 feet out of my hand. And if I could throw it through that brick, 10 feet out of my hand and end up in three different places. I thought then, uh, you know, it'd be tough on the hitter to recognize the pitch that's coming. Gotcha. Well, let's go over some pitch grips because I know, so I was talking to Manny Ramirez last night at a, at a, a fan duel thing. And he said, I want to know how Greg Maddox made the ball move the way he did. Like it was cartoon wiffle ball stuff. So let's, let's see these pitch grips. It's just basic two seamer, just two seamer. Let's raise that up a little bit more by your head so we can see it. Yeah. See that there? Yep. Just a big two seamer like everybody throws. You know, I think uh, the key to throwing a two seamer is to have an athletic delivery and good alignment depending on which side of the plate you're throwing to. I think a lot of guys go like this when they throw arm side two seamers. And when they try to throw a two seamer away or glove side, they go like this. And they don't throw it the same way. They aim it with their hand. So, you know, I think, you know, one of my keys was if this is my delivery, when I go away, I got to get over here and throw it the same way. So I think that's how I was able to make it sink on both sides of the plate. And I think uh, when you explain that to, to pitchers that have a hard time throwing it glove side, I think they, they, they get it and they really start to improve on that. Did you do anything, Spet? Like, what finger did it come off of? Did you do anything unusual? Well, hopefully it came off my middle finger. You know, I tried to throw it off my middle finger, and I threw my cutter off my index finger and threw it like a slider, you know, hand right there and just launch it. And uh, change up, I tried to throw off my uh, ring finger. Okay, and you did you pronate it at all? Did you, like, turn it over, or was it just off your ring finger? No, you, you, you you pronate without trying to pronate. So I didn't try to increase the pronation. I just tried to be out, make a nice athletic throw like like you see a shortstop make across the infield. Gotcha. Let's see the – so move it a little bit more towards your head so everybody can see these grips. we got – that's the uh, two-seamer. Two okay, now yeah. cutter is the same thing? Cutter's a slider. Okay, so you're using your so it's four throw seams. A slider off your, you throw a slider off your ring finger yep. or your middle finger, right? And you pull down on it. Yep. Well, if you do it on your index finger, you can't pull down as much, and you know, you just it just cuts. It doesn't doesn't really go down. So, and then if you want to really get specific with it, if it is going down, then 
you know, it's like a ball go up, you got to drop your arm down a little bit. So you would drop your elbow down just a little bit and hope the hitter doesn't pick it up. I have never heard that description of a cutter throwing it off your, your, basically your, your pointer finger instead of your. Yeah. It's basically a, it's basically a hard slider. It's, it's, it's a very hard, aggressive slider that you're not trying to make it break too much. Do gotcha. Do bowl. bowl. It's like if we were bowling and yeah, yeah, we yeah. were going to, you know, we're, we're, we're hooking it, you know, we're throwing a nice little, you know, a nice little draw in there. And then we get a 10 pin and, you know, you're still going to hook it a little, but you got to throw it harder and, and hook it less. And, and, you know, that's, that was kind of my philosophy on a cutter was you got to, you got to throw it hard and, you know, make sure you turn it in. Gotcha. And let me reverse your hand on it just so everybody can see where your fingers are on the, uh, and by your head. Let's right there. Yeah. Now let's turn it the other yeah. way. I want to, I just want to see where the alignment is on the, on the seams. Gotcha. Right there. Okay. Gotcha. But it's not how you hold it. It's how you throw it. So, you know, you can hold it <laughs> this way if you want, you know, you can grab that seam there if you want, you just got to, you know, toy around with it till you find out, you know, what works best for you. Well, I think you make a great point because everybody looks at pitch grips and they're like, oh, that's your pitch grip, but it's how you release it. That is the trick. Yeah. 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 Do you close off, you know, close off a little bit on your slider and breaking ball and open up a little bit on your sinker and change up. Which of those do you think was your best pitch between uh change up cutter two seam? Uh, I think they were all pretty, you know, my, my, obviously my two seamer was probably my best pitch because I was able to locate it. And, you know, you got to have a fastball to pitch. Uh, very few pitchers can pitch off the breaking balls. There are some, but very few can do it. Uh, so, you know, fastball, but I just think, you know, they would all complement one another. You know, the cutter complemented the sinker and the sinker complemented the change up and, and nothing beats location. If you throw the ball where you're trying to throw it, that trumps everything. Where did you learn the front hip two seamer? Cause that seems like a pitch that you have to have a lot of trust in. Cause if you don't do it right, it may get hammered or you're going to hit somebody. Well, you know, that's one of those myths, you know, you can't throw a lefty down and in that's where they like it. And, uh, you know, I threw it in the minor leagues and I would strike a guy out and I would hear a nice pitch and I'd give up a home run and I would hear, you can't do that. You're never supposed to ever try to do that again. And then uh, I watched Hershiser do it in the big leagues. And I said, well, if Hershiser, if Hershiser can do it in the big leagues, that's a pitch I can throw. I'm going to throw it. So sometimes you have to be your own coach and realize that you know, you're probably the best coach you're ever going to have, and you better learn to trust what you see and trust what you know you can and can't do. Did, did you have a good relationship with Hershiser? Because obviously everyone remembers the little standoff after, you know, uh, was it Eddie Murray that, that uh, you know, got that pitch and yeah. got upset about it? And Hershiser yeah. came out there and said, I got a ball too, or whatever he said. Yeah, yeah, he was, yeah, he was being a tough guy out there that there. <laughs> uh, actually, real good relationship. Always had a ton of respect for him. And uh, never really talked to him a whole lot until the last couple of years. You know, he lives in Vegas now. Oh, cool. And uh, ran into him, at a, you know, see him out at dinner once or twice a year. And uh, got to talk to him a little bit when I was with the Dodgers that one year. And uh, always had a ton of respect for him, admired what he was able to do on the mound. And, uh, you know, he was he was a pitcher. You know, he was a pitcher. And. You know, he was a guy that used his fastball the first time through, his curveball the second time through, and his changeup the third time through. And, uh, you know, he was one of those guys that you alluded to earlier and uh, uh, just a really good pitcher and somebody that I think young pitchers can learn from. Yeah, I mean, he's he's also a great analyst, too. I mean, listening to do games, he does a really good job, I think. Yeah, he knows baseball. Yeah. What is the, the one record you're proud of? Uh, Gold gloves, 15 wins over 17 consecutive season. What is the, what is your thing? Uh, well, obviously the World Series ring is the most, you know, is the best accomplishment. You know, I think, uh, you know, to share that with your teammates, your city, your neighbors, 
you know, your family, all that stuff. Obviously, the World Series is up there, number one. And, you know, there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of close seconds. You know, I think uh, probably the five home runs, pretty cool. You know? <laughs> yeah, to bring that's, that up, right? That's pretty cool. You know, I hit as many home runs as Smoltzy, although he doesn't believe it, but it happened. Uh, you know, just, uh, you know, I think I'm pretty proud of the fact that I felt like I got the most out of my ability. I think that was always the goal was to go out there and always continue to try to get better and get the most out of your ability. And, and, and that's something I, I thought I was pretty good at, even in the last couple of years when, you know, I was topping out at 83 and 84 miles an hour. Is, is there a guy today that you really love watching pitch? Like, you know, you have Shohei, you have, uh, I mean, you know, DeGrom who's been hurt, but is there a yeah. guy that... You know, I like, you know, obviously all the good ones, you know, Kershaw, I had a chance to play with him. I think he's one of the few guys left that I actually played with. You know, I enjoy watching him pitch, you know, all the good ones, Verlander, Grom, you know, uh, uh, just, you know, just mostly the good ones. I don't watch as much baseball as, as, as I would like, you know, I think being retired, you kind of, uh, probably watch too much Netflix and not enough live sports. You know, I am looking forward to football starting. I'll watch a lot of, I'll watch the NFL when that kicks back up here shortly. But, uh, you know, I just admire the guys that, that do it the right way. And I, and, you know, I admire the guys that go out there and, and, and win games, try to win games instead of just try to, you know, throw it north somewhere in the batting cage as hard as they can. Gotcha. So let's talk a little bit about what Chase is doing, because I thought it was really cool trying to help out young players. Um, give a little bit of background. And he does have a discount code that I would get my butt kicked by Chase if I don't give it. It's NBC <laughs> Pitching Ninja. You get 10 percent off. Yeah, he's just starting out. You know, he uh, uh, you know, I'm happy for him. He, he loves baseball. You know, he uh, uh, played six years at UNLV. I think he had a COVID year and a red shirt year. And uh, he likes coaching. He's very coachable. He he knows a game. He understands the game. Uh, he, he he knows what it's like to not be the uh, uh, first guy off his scholarship off his high school team. You know, I think he was about the seventh or eighth guy off his team to find a place to play somewhere when he was going through it. And uh, uh, it's a good way for him to stay in the game, uh, help out younger kids, uh, also offer some some coaching. He uh, actually he's actually a really good coach, believe it or not. I know at UNLV, uh, I would give him one or two pitchers. Hey, man, why don't you take these guys today? I got to go do something else. And uh, uh, he always seemed uh, he's got a good eye for it and understands what pitchers need to have success on the mound. And, uh, you know, if he's able to translate that to some high school kids and, and get them kick started on their college career, you know, I think it'd be a good investment for the parents to go ahead and do that. Yeah, I think it's great. I think it's also great for somebody who's been through it to want to give back and say, these are the hard things that I had to deal with. Maybe I can make it a little less tough for somebody else. Yeah, absolutely. You know, anytime somebody's been there, done that, it uh, you'd be a fool not to listen to them if that's something you're about to go through. You know, I know I was lucky enough to have my brother uh, kind of be my mentor in those types of, of spots. You know, he got drafted two years before me. Uh, every place I was about to go, he had already been there, done that. And I was able to rely on him and talk to him about, you know, whatever it took to have a little bit more success on the field. What was it like coaching your kid? Oh, it was great. You know, it was great. It was uh, the only time he listened to me. You know, he wouldn't clean his room or, or, or take out the trash, but he would – you know, he would try to open up and get his arm on top and, and, and try new grips and work on his kickoff move, you know, and, and field and all that stuff. So, uh, uh, you know, it was great working with him. I wish, I mean, it, I wish I had, you know, a whole staff of guys like him. It, it, it would just make coaching that, that much more enjoyable. Yeah, it was one of those, like, I mean, I coached my kid growing up too. And it was one of those things, like, I tried to not talk to him during games because I knew, like, the only voice he would hear is mine. Oh, well, yeah, I'd talk to mine. I mean, I'd tell them mom jokes between innings, so that was always fun. <laughs> are any of them clean, or are you? Uh... Eh, some of them were. <laughs> well, great. Hey, man, it's been great talking with you. I will let you run. I'm sure you got to go play golf or something. By the way, my brother lives in Vegas, and he is a card player. He's a, a professional poker uh -oh. player. Yeah. Uh-oh. 
be wary of those guys. Yeah, exactly. Be wary I won't, of those guys. Don't bet them on the golf course. I know that. <laughs> I, I won't get you into one of his games because it would it wouldn't be fun for you. Yeah, no, it wouldn't. It wouldn't. Yeah, those guys are good, man. Uh, you know, I played a little poker growing up, and uh, I realized just how good those guys are. Yeah, I mean, it, it's a very math oriented game. Like it's it's math. Yeah. And, yeah. Yeah. You talk about odds and probability and then they throw in the ability to read somebody. I mean, uh, tough to beat. Yeah. I and mean, kind of like. Pitch. Well, hopefully <laughs> circle back. All right. Well, thank you for thank you for coming on. It's been a pleasure. All right. Thanks Take for care. having me.